Uh, all right, good morning. Uh, my topic is Make Me an Offer. You can tell that The Godfather has been in reruns on TV. Uh, and so uh, that's where my title came from. What does it have to do with? I don't know. It sounded really good at the time. Uh, but I do know this, that Science of Mind offers us an opportunity and uh, to reference another TV show, the early Star Trek TV shows, where they'd say that we're going where no man, boldly going where no man has gone before. Well, I think in the Science of Mind, we're boldly going where few have gone before. Uh, and I, I wonder, you know, for us today that I know in the midst of whatever we're going through in our life, we all have some level of faith. And I wonder, do we apply the faith that we have to the situations, the circumstances, the people that are in front of us right now? So in the Bible, uh, Peter can walk on the water as long as he's looking at, uh, as long as he's looking at Jesus, right? But when he looks at the problem, when he looks at the water, when he looks at the waves, he sinks. So he has to be focused solidly on the principle, and then there is nothing greater than that. And I think this is just like us. You know, when we're in a, a situation, it's so easy to look at the waves, to look at the sea, to look at the water, to look at all the reasons why we're going down, as opposed to focusing on what's the spiritual truth, what's the principle here, and if I focus on that, then there's nothing greater than that. In Proverbs, it says how faith without works is dead. And so humanly, I think when we get into fear, we run to the external world for support, right? If I get afraid about something, what I've been taught to do is look outside of me, what out here is going to fix that, right? And I say, wow, you know, what are we putting our trust in? Because in science of mind, you know, we've got to practice these principles and make these principles an active part of our daily life. So when I'm not committed... I'm, I'm inconsistent, and so are my results. This is, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sharing very honestly with you what I notice about things, is that if we're not committed in our practice, if we're not committed in keeping our thought elevated and keeping on the affirmative side of the street, what we'll find is, yeah, we're having an inconsistent uh, experience. You know, people, um, people will say, well, I know that, you know, and what they mean is that they've heard it. You know, people have said to me again and again, oh, yeah, science of mind, I know all about that. I tried it. It didn't work for me. And I say, really? That's so interesting. You know, did you, did you meditate every day? Did you treat every day? Did you affirm? Were you studying our, our work? And they say, well, well, no, but, you know, I, I heard the message. I know it's all about the mind, you know, stuff like that. Say, because, you know, we know it to the degree that we're practicing it. You know, just being acquainted with something, you know, doesn't mean it's actually incorporated into your life. And so um, Ernest Holmes in our textbook talks about trust, and I think that trust is a confident expectation. And it takes time and practice to learn that God is our source, which is what we teach, to learn that truth does not change. So Ernest said this in our textbook, and I love this. I thought this was great. He said, we shall learn to control our thought processes and bring them into line with reality. He says, thought should tend more and more toward the affirmative attitude of mind that is positive, stable, and above all else, toward a real unity with the spirit that is already complete and perfect. We should be able to look a discordant fact in the face and deny its reality. Wow, wow, that's a lot, that's big. So I wanna tell you a story about an elderly woman who called her minister and wanted to talk about her preparations as she was moving into the last leg of her journey on, on earth physically. And so they talked about her final wishes and songs she wanted and scriptures she wanted read and poems she wanted and, you know, and what she was going to wear. Uh, and one more thing, she said, I want to be buried with a fork in my hand. And, uh, and the minister thought, well, that's a unique request. And so he said, you know, in all of my years in participating in church functions, there was, uh, this, was this was really interesting. He hadn't come across this one before. And, uh, and so the woman explained that she said, you know, for years and years and years, I've gone to dinners, church functions, dinners out at places, dinners at friends' homes. And you know, my favorite part was when they're clearing away the dinner plates, they've often leaned in and said, keep your fork. And I knew what that meant. That meant that something really good is coming. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, now I knew it wasn't jello. I knew it wasn't pudding, because for that, you get a spoon. She said, so for keep your fork, I knew it's going to be something really good, 
like cake or pie or something like that, right? So uh, something good, something better is coming. So she says, I keep my fork. And uh, I want people to see me in the casket, she said, <laughs> with a fork in my hand and wonder, what on earth is this woman doing in the casket with a fork? You know? And see, I want you to tell them that something better is coming. So you keep your fork too. And so they said goodbye, knowing that she had you know, a really great grasp on what she wanted for her end of life wishes and that she believed in the ongoingness of spirit. And so she passed some time later. And at the funeral, people saw her in the casket in her favorite dress with her Bible and a fork in her hand. Yeah. And the minister heard people again and again saying, what's with the fork? Why does she have a fork in her hand? That's just really weird. So in the service, he told them about the fork and what it symbolized to her. And he could not stop thinking about the fork. So my invitation to you this morning is the next time you reach for your fork, remember that God has made you a great offer, a great place for your life, and it all gets better. It gets to get better all the time. We say, oh, God, you know, uh, you know show, me, show me what you got. Well, we believe in the science of mind that God's good that's available to all of us is infinite. You know, the science of mind promises that the one who will comply with its teachings, that they shall be able to bring greater possibilities and happier conditions into their experience. Comply with the teachings. That means that you and I have to do something, right? So I know life, happen, uh, life happens is in the process of happening for all of us. You know, we may have an idea and we're finding ourselves, you know, suddenly on another track, you know, uh, uh, pursuing a career, and then all of a sudden, oh my God, there's family. You know, pursuing a career, and then there's a totally different job. You know, I mean, life, life unfolds for people, I don't want to say unconsciously, but largely people bounce from one thing, they bump into the next thing, to the next thing, and it just kind of happens. So I think we have to make a choice to do what we believe is the right thing. See, I believe every person is, is seated with greatness. That something in us knows we have to get, we have to let our light shine, right, to make a difference, to do good things. See, the world um, looks a, um, a particular way. You know, through our physical eyes, the world looks a particular way. You know, the world says external things, external things, go outward, go outward, go outward to find your solution. But you know, we believe that what the Spirit says is, no, no, go in, turn inward, turn inward, turn inward. So there was a rabbi, uh, Zusha was his name, and he was dying and his students gathered around him, uh, and he was sharing some of his regrets and he lamented about, parts, lamented about parts of his life that he did not feel particularly fulfilled. And students said, but, but rabbi, you're, you're the greatest. You're the greatest teacher we've ever known. You've done such wonderful things. You've taught and spoken so beautifully for years. And he said, in the moment of his death, he said, when I meet God and I do my life review, he said, I don't think God will say to me, Zusha, why were you not a great scholar? Zusha, why were you not a great teacher? Why were you not a great leader or a great order? I think God will say to me, Zusha, why were you not a great Zusha? You know? Why were you not the best version of you that you could be? Why did you not become all that you were meant to be? See, people who have um, these near-death experiences, I think this is really fascinating, they come back and say that, they, that all the things that they thought were important before are not so important now. It really, it really changes them, you know, that what is important is to experience, to express, to give and receive love. That, that, across the boards, that's what people who have these near-death experiences come back and say. That's what the soul longs for. Your soul, my soul, our souls long to experience greater love. That's why we're here. So I don't believe, and the science of mind does not teach a judgmental God, but we have a life review, I think, from a place of uh, pure clarity, right? that we get to have a review. Paul says in the New Testament, I used to see as through a glass darkly, but now I see face to faith. I used to see in a more clouded way, but now I see very clearly. Um, it's interesting that many people in our culture, probably more than any place else in the world, suffer from a heart condition. You know, 
We say, and, that's, and I think that's an interesting question for us as metaphysicians to ask from a spiritual point of view. What is the condition of my heart today? See, your heart is like any other muscle in your body. It has a natural rest phase built in. It works and it rests, and it works and it rests. So um, some native cultures believe that the heart is the bridge between the father sky and the mother earth. And so for these uh, indigenous traditions, the heart is described as being full, open, clear, and strong. That's a really healthy heart, a heart that's full, open, clear, and strong. So if we're not full-hearted, we approach people in life in a half-hearted way. So that's not hard to imagine. We have all perhaps done that at some time. You know, well, I should do this, but oh, I just don't want to. When we're having that kind of a little conversation in our head, it's half-hearted. Well, I've got to go meet somebody, but I don't really want to do that. Half-hearted. Um, if we're not open-hearted, that necessarily means that we are closed-hearted. And it shows up often as being defensive. So I don't know if this has ever been you. I've certainly been down this road. It shows up as encountering our own resistance to things, protecting ourselves from the possibility of being hurt. So not open-hearted is closed-hearted, and we can see how that could really, really limit our experience of life. Now, not clear-hearted would mean that we have doubt, that we have just really moved in with our doubt, that we need to wait for clarity, you know, we're, we're not able to take action right now because we're not clear-hearted. And the last one about being strong-hearted is where we lack the courage to be authentic or say what's really, really true for us. Strong-hearted is the courage to be all of who we are in this life. So if we're depleted in the energy of the heart, I think we, we're prey to lots of things that are, that are not so good. Right? We want to keep that heart energy strong. And how we do that is that we study and we do a spiritual practice and we become of service. And doing all of these things, our heart opens. And, you know, I think we all understand that when our heart is open, it feels really good. We say, wow, this is great. I wish I could feel this way all the time, but I don't. Well, why don't I? Well, because I have to keep doing things like, you know, listening to inspiring music and r read inspiring things and walk in nature and be with my animals and be with people who my heart expands around them. You know, think about who you hang out with uh, to consciously enter into community and consciously enter into acts of service. Mm -hmm. uh, I think all of this contributes to our heart being, you know, the way we really want it to be. It's funny that um, people will get stuck playing chopsticks when, when they could play the whole piano, you know? And I think we kind of do that in life, mm -hmm. that, that um, we're not meant to not live this life fully. We are divinely intended to live as fully as we can possibly be. You know, I just think, what if we, what if we told people that we loved them, that we cared about them, that we were concerned about them? You know, obviously children need that, but I mean, do we never stop being those children that need to hear that we are loved and valued and cared for and appreciated and respected? You know, what if we just said that out loud more? You know? What if, we, what if we wrote people little notes and let them know that we appreciated them and cared about them or that we were thinking about them? I can't tell you how many times I've sent somebody a note and I'll hear back from them saying, I can't believe your note came at the perfect time. I was just having the worst day of my life and I got your note and oh my God, it just made such a difference for me. And I think, wow, that made such little, uh, that was, took such little effort on my part, but it made such a difference in someone else's life. Mm -hmm. um, I think also what I notice is that most people feel loved when they feel listened to. Think about it. We don't go a lot of places where people really listen to us, where people just say, tell me, I'm here. I'm here for you. Tell me. You know, and we just allow them without thinking of how we're going to fix them, <laughs> without thinking about what they need to do to be better, you know, to just allow them to be heard. Hmm? 
So there was this little boy, and, uh, and he had heard about God and he decided he wanted to meet God. Yeah, he really did. He wanted to meet God. And so um, he packed a bag, and um, as little boys might do, uh, the little bag he packed is he put in a couple packages of Twinkies. He put in a couple of cans of root beer, some other little things like that, and he walked to the park by himself with his little bag of provisions, root beer and Twinkies, yeah. And he got there and he looked around and there was nobody in the park. It was strange, there was absolutely nobody there except there was this one older lady sitting on a bench all by herself. And so that's where he went. He just went right up to her at that bench and he sat on the bench right next to her. And they looked at pigeons and they looked at squirrels and after a while he opened up his bag and he pulled out the Twinkies and he handed her some Twinkies. Hmm? And so she smiled and she took the Twinkies and she began to eat the Twinkies. And he took out some Twinkies and he ate some Twinkies. And they sat there eating their Twinkies and looking at the birds and the squirrels and without saying a word, a little time goes by and he pulls out a root beer. And he looks at the root beer and he offers her a root beer. She smiles and she takes the root beer. Cracks open the root beer, starts drinking the root beer. He opens a root beer and starts drinking the root beer. You know? Because he thought, well, she might be thirsty. She just had Twinkies, so why wouldn't she be thirsty, right? And so um, they sat there for three hours. Three hours they sat on a park bench. And so it started to get dark, and he packed up to leave. So he put trash in his little paper bag, you know? And, and he turned back. Uh, he, he turned to, to leave, and then he turned and looked at the woman, and he ran up, and he gave her a big hug. And she gave him a big smile, and he went home. And when he got home, his mother said, where have you been today? I've been so worried about you. Where have you been all this time? And he said, I went to the park, and I met God. And she says, and you know what? She's got a great smile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So about that time, the old lady got home, and her grown son said to her, Gee, Mom, you were in the park a long time today. I was kind of worried about you. But, but you look really good. Is everything all right? And she said, well, when I was in the park today, I met God. And you know, he's a lot younger than I thought he would be. <laughs> so I ask you today to think about the condition of your heart. Just ask yourself, is my heart full? Is my heart open? Is my heart clear? Is my heart strong? because I think that's the heart we want to have, especially as we head toward Valentine's Day. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward. Thank you. So we just turn our attention inward for a moment to recognize that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. It's the most true, real thing about us. We are emanations of the Most High God. And so because I know we are one with God, I also know for each and every one of us that we are one with each other, that we are connected on the unseen side of life. And so I speak the word for us today. I speak this word, which we know is the beginning of all creation, is the word. I speak the word for us that we are full-hearted, open-hearted, strong-hearted, and clear-hearted this day and every day. And if there's something that we're holding on to that does not serve us, whether it's a thought or a habit, an idea, a way of being, if it does not serve us, I speak the word that we willingly let it go. That whatever is in our life that is not for our greatest good, we willingly surrender that right now. Knowing that as we make space, that spirit rushes in and fills that space with something new and better for everyone involved. So we include in our prayer our family members and friends, our parents and children. We know that right where they are, God is fully present. We let our prayer be a blessing energy in the world that we live in. So just imagine the energy of your heart emanating out from this sanctuary, reaching out and touching people everywhere as a blessing, as a healing, as an energy of love and upliftment. We let our prayer go into those situations that look so difficult in the world. So we claim healing and peace and all needs met and restoration and all good for people everywhere. We bless our church. We bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. 
and I know we're blessed by being together. So it is with an open, gracious, full heart that I say thank you, God, that this is the truth for each and every one of us. We stand as open, willing vessels for your light and your love. And with a full heart, I just release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.